Hello, everybody. Welcome to 107.7 FM New Orleans. You're listening to What the Freak Live. I'm your host, Emily, and I have Mr. Will Martinez with me from Dark Friends Radio. Hello. Here. Good evening. I don't, Happy I don't Friday. I keep forgetting I have this device over here that does this stuff. <laughs> I don't All even the sound hear effects? it. it it's no, not even working. I don't hear it. No. <laughs> I got to. I got to start implementing this little thing yeah. over here. <laughs> yeah. I'm absolutely. not used to it at all. But uh, thank everybody for tuning in. We appreciate you. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, Mr. Uh, Will. Why do I call you Mr. Will? I don't know. That's weird. Oh, this made me sound like I was 85 years old. That's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. There's Mr. Will. He's the old PE teacher. <laughs> he talks Rogers. about scary stuff. Yeah. Oh, I was thinking it's more like Mr. Rogers was. neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lovely day in the neighborhood. It's a Mr. Will. <laughs> um, he, he has a show, Dark Fringe Radio. You can follow on Facebook and go to their website. He has merch and all kinds of fun stuff. Any new oh, yeah. episodes coming out this week with Dark Fringe? Yeah. We got a new one coming out tomorrow. Uh, it's actually the Hollywood cloning conspiracy. So we're going to be talking all about oh, that. Oh, yeah, Britney Spears that and all that stuff. So we're going to dive uh, deep into that and talk about that. So that's tomorrow's episode. Check Madonna. it out, Dark Fridge Ready Up. Uh, yeah, uh, we didn't get into her too much. I found um, an article think... on Madonna in the 1980s I... where she has clones. Oh, really? In the it 80s? was a newspaper article in the 80s, I think, or it might be early 90s. I believe she had lookalikes back then. I don't know if our cloning technology was as good as it is now back then, mm -hmm. but we talk about all that stuff. It's really cool. Check it awesome. out, darkfringeradio.com. Well, we're streaming live here on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch. We're back into mm -hmm. Twitch, Twitter, and Twitching. Rumble. Twitching. Um, so if you're, <laughs> well, we have one viewer, Allison's, Allison already made a comment. Let, let's oh, get far out. <laughs> there we go. Let's get far out. Twitch a little bit, <laughs> but thank you everybody for tuning in. If you're watching via Facebook and we're using a stream yard and you make comments, um, mm -hmm. or anything that comes up Facebook user, you got to go to streamyard.com backslash Facebook, give Streamyard permission to use your name and picture. We love to see who we're talking to so if that yes. happens please do that we appreciate it uh, please share the show out it helps um our guests it helps our show it helps our network we love y'all um and appreciate you tuning in every friday night here on 107.7 fm so let's get to the important it's stuff pretty. yes yes the important stuff here and that's our guest tonight which is uh dr dean bertram dr dean has a phd in history from the university of sydney australia his doctoral dissertation was titled Flying Saucer Culture, a Historical Survey of American UFO Belief. His writings have featured in a range of publications, including People Magazine, The Spectator, and The Australian. His ho he also hosts podcasts, Talking Weird, and The Mysterious Library on the Untold Radio Network. He is also the creator. Um, he's also a filmmaker and um, film festival programmer. Um, he actually founded Midwest Weird Fest out in Wisconsin. So let's bring Dr. Ding on to the show right now. Dr. Dean. Dr. Dean. Well, well, greetings, Miss Emily and Mr. Yeah. Will. There we go. Mr. Will again. <laughs> well, well, I got Dr. Dean and Mr. Will. This kind of I know. like a book, like Sherlock yes. Holmes or something. Uh -oh. Yeah. Uh -oh. yeah. <laughs> it's great to be back, by the way. I have so much fun. Thank you for talking to you guys. Absolutely. Oh. Thanks for coming back on. My pleasure. Yeah. Oh, we love to have you come back on, especially when it's uh, we're talking about top topics that is controversial and it's still ongoing and yes. you just never know what you're getting from the government <laughs> or or in history obviously too history is not the real history that they give us so we appreciate you so much coming back on um dr dean do you want me to call you dr dean <laughs> you can you can just call me dean <laughs> okay dean we appreciate it. so real quick i know i gave you a little rundown and you've been on the show before if you don't mind just to tell other people maybe some projects and stuff you're working on or introduce sure. yourself a little bit more well, I think your your nice little bio read of me is probably fairly accurate. I mean, my background is I'm an American historian and I wrote a dissertation on UFO belief. Now I run a genre and paranormal type film festival called Midwest Weird Fest in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And I host Talking Weird, as you said, and Mysterious Library on the Untold Radio Network. What I'm most excited about at the moment, though, is the documentary I'm shooting, which is called The Man Who Invented Flying Saucers. Now, I didn't invent that term. I actually stole it from John Keel, the famous Fordian author of The Mothman Prophecies, mm -hmm. who wrote an influential piece in 1982 for Fordian Times, a magazine I've also been lucky enough to write for, where he suggested that Raymond Palmer, who was an editor of pulp magazines in the 1940s, 
pretty much set up everything people would believe about UFOs, which came shortly thereafter. He had a, a run of stories called The Shaver Mystery, which was based on the supposedly real experiences of a Richard Shaver, who claimed to have ongoing contacts with an ancient civilization that lived underground. In fact, there was a good civilization and an evil civilization. There were the Darrow, who were the bad guys, and the Terror, who were the good guys. And a lot of the stuff in The Shaver Mystery set the tone for what was to come after Kenneth Arnold saw his UFO sighting in 1947. So there was ancient spacefaring civilizations, there was mind controlling alien beings, there were big cover ups, there was abductions, there was all of the type of stuff that we came to get used to as UFO belief. And even more significantly, when Kenneth Arnold had first had his original UFO sighting, which led to the term flying saucers, Kenneth Arnold, the same editor of Amazing Stories who ran the Shaver mystery and helped write it with Richard Shaver, employed Kenneth Arnold. And he very soon became involved with Arnold, publicized Arnold's story, publicized a bunch of other UFO stories early on, founded the, the biggest circulating flying saucer magazine at the time called Flying Saucers from Other Worlds. And in the early days, as John Keel said, really beat the drum for UFO belief, really perpetuated the ideas that we all tend to believe today, and was front and center in much of the creation of what we think about when we think about UFOs. Now, of course, most people who are interested in UFOs today, whether with a passing interest or even a little bit more of a serious interest, most people are unaware of of Ray Palmer's significant contribution to what they believe now. And John Keel wasn't the only person to say it incidentally. Long before him, most people who took the subject seriously, like the arch skeptic Donald Menzel, wrote in books that Kenneth Arnold had essentially created most of this, not Kenneth Arnold, sorry, Ray Palmer had essentially created most of this, I suppose, UFO belief or mythology or whatever you want to call it. So I, why I'm making a documentary is I just, I wrote, written about him in my PhD dissertation, agreeing with Keel and Menzel and other people who said how important Ray Palmer was in the formation of this, never knowing when I wrote it in Sydney back in the, you know, back in the kind of the late nineties into the mid two thousands that I'd end up living in central Wisconsin. And I'd, I, I never forgot Ray Palmer, but I had no idea exactly where he lived. You don't pay attention to the state of Wisconsin when you're in Sydney, Australia, somewhere in America in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And only somewhat recently, like a year ago, a bit less than a year ago, I was restudying the Shaver mystery stuff for a podcast I do for mysterious library. And mm -hmm. I came across the fact that Palmer, and Shaver lived in Amherst, Wisconsin. I thought, how far can Amherst, Wisconsin be from where I am? <laughs> I plugged it into the Google and they were literally down the road in the neighboring county. Like it was a back road commute. And I'm like, I'm in the middle of nowhere. I can make a documentary about these people. It's never been yeah. done. So yeah. that's how, yeah, that's what I'm doing at the moment anyway. Long story short or short story long perhaps. I have a question for you and then I'll have Will. So you're from Australia. What made you so intrigued with the history of America, specifically with the UFOs? Mm -hmm. Is well, Australia, I, they are they not that into it as, as Americans or? No, there's a big, I mean, there's a big component of people in Australia who believe in UFOs. But I think that mm -hmm. A, I was interested in America. So my ba I already had a background in doing American history at an undergraduate level. Mm -hmm. But when I became interested in the flying saucer phenomenon again uh, after my undergraduate degree it's hard to talk about ufos without talking about america and most of the things people believe universally about ufos comes out of the american tradition now you can you can certainly you can look at other cultures like you can look at early saucer sightings up until today in places like C Central and South America, and often the beings look different or the encounters are more violent. So there are different cultural, you know, particulars. But the reality is when we talk about UFOs in the, the mid 20th century up to today, we talk about things like Roswell. We talk about things like the first Kenneth Arnold sighting. We talk about things like Area 51. We talk about things now like, you know, congressional UA UAP hearings. So it's hard. I mean, America, it's it'd be like writing, I guess, about... I don't know, the significance of the Latin language and not be looking at Rome if you were writing back in, you know, the first century or something. You know what I mean? Like there's a center to where all of this stuff kind of emerges out of. And it really is the United States. So you could you could absolutely do a history about UFO belief in South America or in Australia or in the UK or anywhere else. But the big the big parts of the mythology come from American science fiction movies and from those really famous cases that I just mentioned. Mm. 
Allison, a viewer, has a question too. Um, I'm sorry, Will. Um, how no. old was he when he realized study of UFOs would be his path? Thank you, Allison. I was, I was early, early to mid twenties. It was around the time I was finishing my um, my BA degree, maybe just after. And I bumped into this UFO book called Encounters by a psychologist whose name was Edith Fiore, and it was essentially an early alien abduction book. I might have told this story the last time I was on, so I won't I won't go down the big rabbit hole, but I became very interested in that book. And before I went back to do my master's degree, which I did a couple of years after I finished my BA, I started to just read UFO material all the time. And I hadn't paid any attention to it since I was a kid. I was a kid of the 70s, so I was interested in flying saucers. I'd watch things like In Search Of, I'd seen Close Encounters, I'd seen ET. You couldn't grow up in that kind of 70s, early 80s milieu and not be really interested in the topic. But as I became a teenager, I wasn't interested in it at all. So discovering that Edith Theore book, which I just happened to bump into it like a, a, a sale outside of a bookstore. They had a table there and I picked it up and I'm like, what's this about alien abduction? And so I went down this rabbit hole and then I, I wanted to go back and do a master's anyway. And I thought, I'm spending all this time looking at weird UFO material. Why not kind of segue into an actual academic study? So I first did my master's research on the topic. And then after that, I, I went and did a PhD where I looked at it a little more vigorously. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, Dr. Dean or Dean, let me just do that. I'm sorry. Um... That's okay, Mr. Will. <laughs> Um, Dean, I wanted to ask you a question. So Palmer was responsible uh, for laying the foundation for a lot of this mythology, right? That's um, do you believe that was by design by him or maybe from outside forces, maybe say the government, because maybe say they, you know, they were encountering this as well. So maybe they needed some kind of story to kind of maybe, you know, throw a smoke screen out there for the rest of us, out, you know, during that time. What do you think? It's interesting that you bring that up because when I talk to people about the topic, some of my friends who are particularly in a more conspiratorial space are interested in conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. And there's good reason to doubt the government narrative of UFO today. And there's mm -hmm. good reason to look at the involvement of US intelligence agencies in various UFO affairs, like the Benowitz affair in the late 70s is a classic, which we can talk about if you want to later. But my mm -hmm. point is a lot of people say, well, if Palmer's starting to create all of this stuff, Maybe, as you're suggesting, well, maybe he was somehow following, you know, some kind of intelligence gathering or intelligence operative kind of line or sting or side like or project blue beam or something like yeah, that. You know, you know I, I honestly, I honestly don't think so. I think Palmer just happened to have his finger on the pulse of what readers wanted. And mm -hmm. when Richard Shaver wrote his first letter to Amazing Stories, and I think it was about 1943, which was supposedly his discovery of an ancient language which predated all modern languages and was a root language, kind of like um, kind of like people had suggested about ancient Atlantean languages in the past, but it was Shaver's own take on it. Mm -hmm. Palmer realized that this letter was probably going to be popular, so he published it, and he had massive reader response. And then he went, okay, let's keep going with the Shaver stuff. And Shaver sent him another manuscript which was called Warning to Future Man, which was just this 10,000-word manuscript which talked about an ancient alternative civilization with these advanced technological beings on Earth in pre-Diluvian times mm -hmm. and how today there were still creatures living under the Earth using the technology left behind from this ancient race when most of them fled to the stars and interfering with humanity and abducting people and with, you know, advanced flying saucer type craft and mm -hmm. shaver at least palmer turned that ten thousand word kind of breakdown of just a history into a thirty thousand word science fiction story called mm -hmm. i remember lemuria which they ran in a 1945 i believe issue of amazing stories and mm -hmm. that was such a popular issue supposedly that it drove the publication from 135,000 magazines a month to 185,000. Like they sold out that issue. Palmer had already wow. grown the magazine. Like when he took over, when he took over years before the Shaver mystery, the magazine was mm -hmm. essentially bankrupt and had been acquired by a publisher called Ziff Davis. And I think it had 30 or 40,000 
like readers. That was or 30, 30 to 40,000 issues a month was all that was bought. Mm. So Shaver or brother Palmer had already bought it up from that figure to 135. But mm. the Shaver mystery supposedly drove it from the very first issue. They ran a cover story on the Shaver mystery to 185. And then according to Palmer, it got as high as quarter of a million. Quarter of a million was an awful lot of magazines yeah. to sell in yeah, the whole space back in the 1940s. It was phenomenal. Absolutely. Yeah. And so John Keel's point, was everybody so many people have been exposed to drawings of flying saucers in these things before the term even existed just mm -hmm. these type of stories that suggested there were extraterrestrial civilizations and ancient civilizations under the earth interfering with us and so much of the narrative been set by this very popular narrative i mean it was so popular it wasn't just in science fiction magazines it was criticized in um it was criticized in mainstream magazines like there was a piece in um mm. There was a piece in, I think it was, it was Harper's that criticized it. Like, and that was a major circulatory, circulatory magazine back then. That probably had even a bigger circulation. It was like a Time magazine. A lot of people read that. So America was conscious of the Shaver mystery. And so much so that there was so much backlash by by hardcore science fiction fans, which was a very small number, maybe a thousand people, as opposed to the two hundred thousand who were reading it for the Shaver mystery. The people who wanted real science fiction got so angry with the Shaver mystery, because it was saying this was all true that they had this massive letter writing campaign and protests, and then that Harper's um, magazine I mentioned called out the publishers by name, Ziff and Davis, and said, you know how how disappointing and crazy the shaver mystery stuff is so eventually palmer was told by the publishers and he was the editor of this magazine and a number of magazines in their fiction group he was kind of the head of their pulp fiction group that he couldn't run any more shaver material at least as truth so mm. it kind of killed this but the shaver mystery had these two amazing years of just front and center running yeah. and what's so significant yeah. to me as an historian is the 1947 issue the June 1947 issue. So June is when you took it off the newsstand. So it had already been on the mm -hmm. newsstands up until the time when Kenneth Arnold had his famous sighting of the nine objects, which he described as moving like discs would if you threw them across water. That issue was already on the stands when Kenneth Arnold had his sighting. And that issue was the all Shaver mystery issue. Shaver, the Shaver mystery was already taking up a major amount of space in the magazine every month. Most mm. of the cover art was Shaver mystery stuff. Most of the content was Shaver or similar Shaver stories. But this issue was the entire Shaver mystery issue. It's all that was in that. And in mm. that issue, a, a major Fordian writer of the day called Vincent Gatters wrote a piece called Visitors from the Void. And this is before we had the term flying saucers. He was talking about flying saucers in history before we had the term that we were being visited. That's the issue. Emily just pulled it up. Okay. That's the Shaver mm -hmm. mystery right there issue, the June 1947 issue. So Vincent Gaddis is talking about flying saucers without using the term in that issue, not in a fictional piece, like doing a literal Fordian piece about all the times people are seeing these things throughout history and they're still seeing them. And then Kenneth Arnold has his sighting that month and the entire news services of the world explode with this new term flying saucers and the flying mm -hmm. saucer error is off and running and almost immediately ray palmer the editor of amazing stories the person who coined the term the shaver mystery the person who ghost wrote a lot of shavers early material contacts kenneth arnold employs kenneth arnold to write for his new magazine fate magazine which palmer was just in the process of launching and also in to investigate a crash at maury island a supposed ufo incident that happened before even kenneth arnold sighting before even roswell where near maury island in pugent sound these people in a boat saw essentially supposedly six disc shaped craft or donut shaped crafts. They were hollow in the middle. And one of them started spewing out metallic debris onto the beach, onto their boat, killed a dog, wounded the guy's son who was the captain of the boat. And it became a mass. It became a pretty significant story, at least in UFO circles. It still is. And Palmer hired Kenneth Arnold to go and investigate that story. And that story, which, which has the first reference to things like men in black, missing time ufo crashes again this is before even the roswell story had erupted originally all of these things are in this first book called the coming of the sources that ken arnold wrote with raymond palmer about his investigation and there are historians who say ray palmer actually wrote mo most of that book and just took some of kenneth arnold's reporting and spun the story 
but almost everything we think about UFOs the, today, crashes again, abductions, missing time, men in black, government cover-ups that will, uh, or, or large cover-ups, whether they're government or not, that will go so far as to kill Air Force officers. All of this material is in a book that Palmer and Arnold wrote back in the very early days of flying saucer research. So again, it kind of points to the fact that Palmer was shaping the mythology that would come, the things that people still believe in, was being written about by Ray Palmer before it was anybody else. Well, it's interesting that all this stuff is happening back then around the same time that pretty much that we know of in current history. I call it current history, but MK Ultra mind a psychoelectric weaponry and and all the mind games microwave technology which we're seeing a lot about today do you think that this is might be a hard question to ask do you think that these alien encounters or these ufo encounters or anything like that do you think the government could be that advanced to make to brainwash us into thinking that it's actually UFO, but it's actually the government or military. And because um, it just seems like they throw out UFO when it's convenient and mainstream media now has accepted the terms and it used it over and over and over again, which is a symbolism of brainwashing. So do you think that they're trying to just use this? This is all a big, huge distraction. I think, again, some of the answers to that we can go back to the Shaver mystery quickly for. One of them okay. is that but m much of Ray Shaver's, not Ray Shaver's, I'm, I'm putting their names together, much of Richard Shaver's imaginings about what was happening on were originally brought onto him by voices in his head. He was hearing aliens talking in, in his head. So we have to be conscious okay. of... We have to be conscious of when we talk about some of this modern weaponry that can supposedly do that, that there are people who have psychological issues where they do hear voices in their head. And they have since the time of Richard Shaver and they have since the time of time immemorial. You can look at a lot of type of even prophets might just have been hearing voices, not all, but I think certainly some people who have religious type experiences. It might be a, there might be a psychological experience to bring it forward today to, to suggest is some of this technology real now and being used as an historian i don't think i don't really have the skill set to dissect that entirely but i will say that the u.s government has been involved in one way or another in the flying mystery flying saucer mystery since it began so and interestingly, the FBI investigated Ray Palmer and Richard Shaver back in the day in 47. And there's an FBI memo which says the flying saucer craze has probably been invented by Ray Palmer and Richard Shaver to sell more issues of their magazine. So that's an FBI memo from back in 1947. So I, while that might not be involvement, that shows interest. But certainly as we move through the history of UFOs, the government has taken a vested interest in watching civilian groups who research UFOs, spreading disinformation about UFOs, being careful about how that information is controlled. So whether it's the early days where there was a genuine concern of maybe the Russians would be able to use this information or this knowledge that there was UFO belief to kind of trigger a panic in the US population, which they didn't want to have happen. So they tried to play down source reports through CIA documents, well, actually written by historians employed by the CIA, who say we knew that most of the sightings in the 1960s were our own, i.e., U.S. advanced craft being sighted and um, and misinterpreted as flying saucers, like the U-2, for example. So, but we were happy to spin that story because it keeps people, you know, confused and looking in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Up through the Benowitz affair, which I mentioned before in the late 1970s, when Paul Benowitz, who was an electrical engineer who lived opposite Kirtland Air Force Base, started believing he was seeing UFOs near the base and thought he was picking up on extraterrestrial transmissions. So he went to the base to report this being a good patriot. And what had actually happened apparently was Benowitz had stumbled onto some advanced, perhaps laser messaging system or the like that the U S air force were testing inside the base. So instead of swearing him to secrecy and explain to him what it was, the OFL SI there, decided that they would run an intelligence campaign against him and convince him that there really were extraterrestrials. And it went so far as they gave him a computer that supposedly decoded the messages and just spat out all this 
ridiculous extraterrestrial communication information to fly him, flying him over the Dulce Mesa and saying there's been crash sources here and his entries to a UFO base under the Mesa, to all these various things. And supposedly, according to Richard Doty, who was the intelligence agent at the top of that operation, there were other agencies involved with the Benowitz affair as well who were interested. There wasn't just the AFOSI from the Air Force. There was at least the NSA, probably the CIA. And we know he Benowitz was being watched and he was fed a lot of information that wasn't true. And a lot of what Benowitz said became part of what UFO believers believe today. The idea that underneath Dulce there is an extraterrestrial base comes from the, comes from the Paul Benowitz affair for example. Mm. William Moore, who was the most important, perhaps, writer in the UFO community at the time, he's the person who, with Charles Berlitz, wrote the very first book about Roswell. Roswell had been forgotten from 1947 after the Air Force retracted that original sighting when the US Air Force said it wasn't really a, 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 a disc-shaped craft we recovered. It was just a weather balloon. The immediate mm -hmm. day after the initial report where they said, we've got a flying saucer. From that moment on, the American public forgot about it. The UFO community didn't talk about it. I have a couple of encyclopedias about UFOs from the 1980s. Literally from 1980, there's one by, I think, Margaret Sachs and Ronald Story. I have my bookshelf both there. Both really good UFO encyclopedias. Neither of them even mentioned the word Roswell in there. Nobody was mm -hmm. thinking about Roswell in the late 1970s until Charles Berlitz, who was really just the front man because he was a famous author anyway, and William Moore, along with Stanton Friedman, who most people in the UFO community still know, did the supposed research into Roswell to break this story. Now, here's the fascinating part of the, the puzzle, perhaps. William Moore and Stanton Friedman were later also at the heart and, heart and core of pushing out the MJ-12 documents, which is much of the current belief that the US government had this secret kind of internal government group doing deals with extraterrestrials and controlling the UFO knowledge. Mm -hmm. Those That story originated when a, a role of film of the documents was sent to Jamie Shandera, who was colleagues with William Moore, the guy who wrote the, the, the first Roswell book, and they broke that story, Mill and Shandera and, and William Moore. Now, in the 1989 MUFON Symposium, William Moore, again, the guy who broke the MJ-12 story, broke the Roswell story, was involved with the Benowitz affair, comes forward at the, at the biggest UFO convention in the world, the MUFON Symposium in 1989. And he gets up on stage and says, I was an AFOSI asset working under Richard Doty. We've been feeding you, we've been feeding Benowitz and people like you all this false information. I've been spying on you, giving information back to the Air Force. Essentially, the man who created our belief in Roswell, uh, our current belief in Roswell anyway, the MJ-12 documents involved in the Benowitz affair, which creates the underground base mythology of Dulce, although you can trace that back to Richard Shaver as well, but that's another story. But the modern, the modern packaging of X-Files UFO belief, I'll call it that because everybody knows what that means, underground bases, secret alien government, you know, no. dealings, abductions, all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So much of that is started by a cadre of intelligence assets and intelligence agents Doing, um, uh, doing this kind of psyop against Paul Benowitz and then pushing it out into the UFO community in the late 70s into the early 80s. And by 89, they admit to it. But the UFO community just get mad with the messengers. They just scream at William Moore on stage and somebody yells, we're going to get a fire hose and blast you off the stage more. And people are crying and screaming. But instead of going, hang on, does that mean everything we believe since 1980, we should be, or since the late 70s, we should be questioning? All these things that have come through more. Yes. They kept the belief system. The X-Files hadn't even been rolled out yet, where it became even more popular. So they kept all of this data they'd been fed by various intelligence assets. And it's still today a heart and center of what most people believe about UFOs. So, so I, I, sorry, you go, Emily. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no I was just going to quickly say I can argue that Ray Palmer and Richard Shaver were the people who created much of this mythology, but it, it got built upon by, to answer, that was a long answer to a short question, but those ideas got built upon certainly by people who were assets of US in, or military intelligence here and agents of military intelligence. So the government's always been involved, I think, in some capacity or Red rather. Flag. And I think you can see that Red coming flag. up now. I think today, even up to the up to the most recent UAP hearings, you can see this happen. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've talked about UFOs and flying saucers and 
before they were called UFOs, I had a question here. Okay, Ed, I have two questions actually from from viewers. But Ed's like, what did they call UFOs before they called them UFOs? Was it flying saucers? It was, it was flying saucers, yeah. Yeah. And then, so we've talked about the UFO and the flying saucers up in the sky, but alien abductions um, testimonies. Have you got researched those a lot too on this on that side? Yeah, I have. As far as the Travis Walton affair, I know that there was some contention with his major witness in the not that distant past. You know, I think it was the boss of his logging crew or something who was one of the major witnesses who I think has come forward. Mike Rogers. Mike Rogers, there you go, who's come forward yeah. publicly, questioned some of Travis's experiences. I know that there's all kinds of theories on why they might have hoaxed it and whatever else. The interesting thing about Walton's experience, be it real or be it not real, is it does seem to differ from most other alien abduction experiences to the fact that he actually physically went missing for a lot of, like a week or something. Mm -hmm. Most other alien abduction experiences, well, an awful lot of them are remembered under hypnosis. And when we talk about missing time, we don't actually mean they were missing from time for a week. It means that the person can't recall a few hours of their day or something. So Travis Walton's one seems to be outside the realm of almost every other alien abduction that we have. Most of them seem to be fairly brief affairs, whether they're real or psychological or spiritual or something else. Walton's is, a, Walton's is so far out there. I think it almost is an outlier. So I'm not sure whether that should be used as a gauge to determine whether alien abductions are real or whether they're not real because his is so different at least in that timeline that I'm, yeah, I'm just not sure yeah. i myself personally don't think travis walton was abducted by extraterrestrials for a week just based off the his story and what you know or what made you determine that just based off i well, based off the fact that his major witness has, you know, been hinting for years right. that it's not true, and based on the fact that if it's if alien abductions are a real thing, this outlier case would seem to not be part of the rest of the experiential package anyway. So, do, I, do I you think know. he had a psychosis moment or something? If he's disappeared out in the woods or something, you never know what, you know, the mind is a battlefield. Do you think he might have had some kind of psychosis? <laughs> Maybe. I know skeptics have suggested it was a hoax and he went and hid somewhere out there. And then when it got more serious, he came back, you know, but I don't know. I mean, I, again, as an historian, I can look at its importance in the narrative and it is important in the UFO belief narrative because it's one of the better known abduction stories and had a major, very scary movie made about it. Incidentally. Like Fire the in the sky. It's a great <laughs> yeah. movie, but it's, it's scarier than the book. Like oh, when he yeah. wakes up and he's like these potato people oh. around him and he's covered with this like slime stuff he can't breathe i mean it's terrifying it plays like a horror movie right yeah mark mark, mark says dean pays me to watch his appearances <laughs> <laughs> i still owe you an email mark mark's been very helpful with booking guests for talking weird and i need to get back to him because he's got some others i haven't i love mark we've been messaging and stuff on facebook um joe, joe what the frick live podcast are you kidding i love you guys thank you joe so much thank you joe um i love joe he, har well. he hardly gets <laughs> live but he, he he does he he locks our show and now ed has a <laughs> has a question what did they call flying saucers before they called them flying saucers if, the, if it's in the shaven if it's in the shaver mythology i think they were rollouts is what they were called <laughs> but i mean throughout for example in the in vincent gaddis's visitors from the void piece in the june 1947 amazing stories he doesn't have a specific term for them he'll just be describing what they look like as did charles fort i guess who'd suggested that these strange lights in the sky might be from elsewhere which is what a lot of the people when the ufo phenomenon began or the flying source of phenomenon began they went hey we have this guy who wrote four books on weird things charles fort and they went back and looked at that ironically again in the pages of Amazing Stories, before the modern flying saucer period began, Ray Palmer was talking about Charles Ford. His authors were talking about Charles Ford. Any reader of Amazing Stories was very very familiar with the idea that Charles Ford had spoken about these weird lights in the sky potentially being from out there and the idea that perhaps we were property from to beings that weren't humans. All these Fordian ideas were already circulating in Amazing Stories long before Kenneth, or at least years before Kenneth Arnold's first sighting. And then, then of course, along with Curtis Fuller, 
um, Ray Palmer launched Fate magazine in 1948, which continued that Fordian type tradition, talking about Charles Fort, employing Fordian authors, pushing Kenneth Arnold's story, pushing Flying Saucer stories. Flying Saucer stories were always a major component of Fate magazine, and Fate's still around today. It's the longest lasting periodical in this space. I mean, it started in 1948, it's still running now. It's been a consistent force. And again, that's down to Ray Palmer. Well, I have a question with these UFOs too, because there's been a lot of um, talk and conspiracy theories and things about these UFOs that they actually come from the water. Have you had any um, research or any of these people that we're talking about this evening, have they spoken about, about the water or... And Certainly. what happened up in Antarctica? I can't remember that guy's name. Remember, um, he went, he flew over Antarctica, and there was that hole, and he was saying that there was aliens, UFOs coming from the hole. Right, Ad Ad Admiral name. Admiral Byrd flew That's over it. the Arctic right. and then Antarctica, and there's all these stories that there exists a secret diary. I've read the secret diary of Admiral Byrd. I think one of the better known. It might even have been like. The late uh, Beckley, Green, uh, Green Beckley's, what's his name? Um, anyway, Beckley's um, late publishing house. But they published, I think, supposedly Bird's diary. So, yeah, Bird's made all the – whether he really made those claims or not is unsure. He, he had a very significant quasi-military expedition to Antarctica after World War II called Operation High Jump, where he took all of these – it was like a serious battle fleet he took down there. And apparently mm -hmm. they came back prematurely because of difficulties, perhaps in Antarctica, perhaps with the weather. But there have been numerous rumours about him fighting Nazis who fled to Antarctica after World War II and maybe put, took flying saucer technology down there to him battling people from the inner earth to all of these kind of stories. I'm not sure how much um, credence I place on any of those tales, but they certainly exist. They're certainly part of inner earth um, the Agartha. Kind of mythology. Yeah, Agatha is yeah. another classic example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Raymond Palmer did an awful lot of pushing Hollow Earth stuff after the Shaver Mystery mm. stories as well. But as far as undersea stuff, Emily, that you asked about, mm -hmm. Ivan T. Sanderson, who was a great cryptozoologist, uh, a, a big friend of John Keel, wrote a significant book called Invisible Residence. I think, I can't remember the date, back in the late 60s sometime. And that book was essentially suggesting that sources may come from beneath the waters of this earth relating mm -hmm. lots of accounts of people seeing things like flying sources and ufos emerging from the waters certainly hal putoff recently who was a member of to the stars academy and has a long background in intelligence and ufo type things wrote a piece called um, The Ultra Terrestrial Theory or something. The, the term ultra terrestrial was actually, I think, originally, Ivan T. Sanderson might even have coined it, but it was popularized by John Keel, who says he used it more as a type of literary device when he was talking about what the flying saucer occupants might really be. He didn't think they were extraterrestrials. He thought they might be some other energy or from some other dimension or something different. So he just used this term ultra terrestrial. That term has now become very popular. If you want to say extraterrestrials are essentially real, but they're not extraterrestrials. They're really from another dimension or from underneath the earth or from somewhere else. So anyway, Hal Putov recently, like a year or so ago, wrote a paper pushing the ultraterrestrial hypothesis. And one of the things he suggests in there is they could be from beneath the waters um, of this planet. The most recent documentary from MUFON, we talked about the MUFON Symposium in 89 before in regards to the Paul Benowitz affair and William Moore blowing the whistle on it. The mm -hmm. most recent MUFON documentary by a director called Ron James. I actually did the world premiere of this documentary. It's called Accidental Truth. I screened it at this year's Midwest Weird Fest. It's an excellent documentary. It has a lot of different people in the UFO world who are heavy hitters and it presents different ideas and actually will present people with very different interpretations which i think is very strong but in that documentary they start to talk about the potential that these things might be from beneath um, the waters of this planet certainly some of the navy footage and navy pilot testimony starts to say these things come from beneath the the waters of this planet the ex-conspiracy theory ufologist who died in a gun battle with local sheriff departments when they were trying to serve him a, a warrant the late william cooper who wrote probably one of the best-selling books about ufos the pale horse mm -hmm. yep yeah the pale horse i have yeah. read that 
it's a it's a great yeah it's a it's a crazy book but it's a great book as far as just a fun read i don't know if any of it's true or not but he he was he was an ex-navy guy and he said he'd seen things submerging from from the water so certainly this idea that they might be beneath the surface of the water or beneath the surface of the planet when it comes to shave or i think palmer even said well some of the caverns where these ets might be or these non-human entities might be maybe they come out through the waters anyway so the idea that the water is an entry point to these other civilizations has a long and um a long and interesting pedigree for sure mm. Well, I'm going to have Will follow up and we got some comments and questions in the chat. So thank you everybody. Right. Too. We're, we're going to put those up too. I want Will to follow okay. up though. <laughs> well, one question, uh, Dean, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, we always talk about, you know, and, and I know your focus is on, you know, American, you know, mythology when it comes to ufology and all that stuff, but have you ever looked into, you know, the stuff that's happened in the UK, like for instance, like the, the Redland Shipman incident, um, you know, which was a you know very well documented incident that happened in the Rendership Forest, and I think in the UK, um, there's actually audio recordings of that, supposedly. I've, I've heard uh, some of them. Um, pretty interesting stuff. Do you get into any of that stuff as well? A little bit. I mean, I know about Rendlesham Forest. My, my, what I thought was the coolest story I'd ever heard about Rendlesham Forest was that the UK's equivalent of the Green Berets, I forget what they're called, but right. they decided to play a trick on the Americans because the Americans had slighted them. So they faked this UFO landing just for the, just for, you know, just for the, let's just say fits and giggles. <laughs> they just did it for the fun of it. Right. And then right. it blew up into this massive UFO story. I like that. I mean, I hope that's the truth because it's such a funny story if it is that these, you know, these, these Brits. So these, English, right? Yeah. These special op Brits are like, we're, we're, like yeah. my British accent. I was about to do an American accent. I'm like, you said, doing British. We're going to go and get revenge on those Amer those Dan Yanks, you know, and they went yeah, out Dan there Yanks, and they did yeah. this ridiculous yeah. thing. And then all of a sudden it's like the ETs were invading in Rendlesham Forest. I don't know if it's the truth or not, but it's my favorite version of that story. Yeah, yeah, me too. I have uh, Allison wants to know what your thoughts are on War of the Worlds. Well, to begin with, Orson, I'm assuming she's talking about the. Well, it's interesting. We can talk about the both the book and we the, can do both. The, the what's fascinating about with the H.G. Wells book is that it comes out. I think 1896, 1897. It comes out around the same time that America has the Great Airship Flap, which is the first great right. UFO wave in this country where from coast to coast people are watching this advanced slightly advanced dirigible flying across the skies and the the papers of the day are reporting people having encounters with the crew and usually it's some either american or european inventor testing some craft because this is on the dawn of heavier than air travel so everybody's super excited about it there's one or two stories in there that suggest it's alien within the ver within the hundreds of various newspaper articles again no, not again, but some, a point I've made before is that this was the famous period of yellow journalism, which was basically when papers which were competing would run ridiculously, you know, exploitative stories that would just try to sell more papers. So the airship was so interesting. There's a very real possibility that newspaper editors across the country were inventing these stories. But it is interesting that, that that's the America's first major UFO flap, and it happens around the same year H.G. Wells publishes his book. As far as the Orson Wells, right. it's ironic that they both have the same last name, even though it's spelt differently, of course. H.G. Mm -hmm. has an E in there and Orson doesn't. Um, it's... Um, or is it the other way around? My mind, I just had a, a brain. It's the other way around. It's the other yeah, way. Yeah, right. my brain just yeah. had a, my brain just went to do. Um, the, as far as the War of the Worlds broadcast, I think it does tell us something about UFO belief. I think it tells us that this is a, the, the early days of World War II when America's kind of on the cusp of entering. And there's, a change in the way that Americans are already viewing technology from the skies, right? Like mm -hmm. when you look at the 1897 airship flap, it's all fun and games essentially. But when you look at the Orson Welles broadcast and modernization of that story, of the story which came out the same time as the airship flap or of the worlds, there is a, a willingness and there's clearly the American public because 
when they were listening to this radio broadcast, supposedly there was a, a panic. And there's different academics who argue yes, how extreme this yeah. panic was. And there's all different. There's, we could go down that rabbit hole forever. But let's just say there was some <laughs> kind of panic. So clearly people, it was the cusp of World War II. There were war nerves, as people called them. But people were also mm -hmm. ready to believe that there could be a threat from the skies descending, right? So there's mm -hmm. been a massive change since before the invention of heavier than aircraft in 1897 to, you know, the late 1930s, cusp of World War II, things in the skies certainly have a more menacing meaning. Now, go forward, go forward nine years after World War II, by the time flying saucers erupt, we've seen the genuine reality of the fear of things in the skies. We've seen the Battle of Britain. We've seen Britain, you know, just bomb after bomb dropping it from the nazis we've seen well i don't know how much the the american and western public were paying attention but the firebombing of dresden we certainly paid attention to what happened in japan with the atomic bombs dropped there there was a genuine fear of things from the skies post post world war ii which was already there i would argue when war of the worlds right. erupted so i think that's almost a proto ufo scare a very short lasted ufo scare but it goes to show that people could get very spooked very quickly and i think that's one of the reasons early on the american government and the people responsible for looking to the sky so noticeably the air force but also the cia and the other the other various alphabet soup type organizations they were concerned that if a fear like that could disrupt internal communications in america it could do all kinds of horrible things so they knew what had happened with the war of the world scare so sea flying saucers erupt on the pages in 47 when america mm -hmm. now isn't entering world war ii it's entering a cold war against the soviets and now we're in the nuclear age, which we weren't back in 38. So I think people, I think that the awareness of that Wells broadcast was part of the reason that officials took flying saucer flaps seriously, not because maybe they thought they were really ETs, but they knew how a public that got spooked could react. Mm. And Ed has a comment here or a question. Can you comment on the, I don't know how you. NICAP. NICAP. Okay. Can you yeah. make comments on that? NICAP was founded by Donald Kehoe, who was the, the kind of author from the Ray Palmer period who's remembered. Donald Kehoe wrote a significant article. I think it was in Look magazine originally, and then it got turned into a, into a book called Flying Sources Are Real in the early 50s. It, was one of the, it wasn't the first book on flying sources, no, certainly not the first article, but it was one of the earliest ones. And it was the one, one of the ones which was taken most seriously. And Kehoe's conclusions, and he wrote a series of books after that, and he certainly ran, NICAP was the first major civilian investigative organization into, into UFOs. Ironically, its entire, um, its entire general board was essentially made up of ex-admirals and ex-CIA people and military <laughs> intelligence. And it's like, what's going on here? Kehoe himself is an ex-Marine major. He also, interestingly, was a pulp fiction author before then. So there's another connection to, to, mm -hmm. to, to the pulps back in the day. But Kehoe set much of the tone for what was to come in UFO belief as well. Kehoe said they were extraterrestrials, or that's what he believed. And he also believed the U.S. Air Force was covering up the story that they were extraterrestrials. So it sets the tone for much of what we believe today as well. Of course, when Kehoe suggested it, he didn't think the Air Force were covering it up because it was an X-Files type conspiracy where they were abducting people and preparing for alien invasion and the US Army, Air Force, whoever was involved were evil. He thought that they were covering up because they didn't want to panic the public again like what i was saying a minute ago and he thought that the public could handle it they might need to be given all the sensitive information but they needed to be given the truth that this was ongoing extraterrestrial visitations and flying sources so nicap kind of controlled civilian interest or the respectable side of civilian investigations into flying sources for a very long time so much so that Kehoe and the people who ran NICAP did not like UFO reports where there were occupants. So they assumed there were occupants in these crafts, but if anybody like a contactee, like George Adamski, for example, who claimed to be in contact with flying saucers 
where the pilots were from Venus or the, the occupants were from Venus or anybody else who had an encounter with Little Green Man or whatever you'd want to call them at the time, NICAP did not like those reports at all. So that was type, that was almost the serious wing of ufology. And over here, which was probably the wing that Palmer was still very much involved in in those days, was happy to have broader, more interesting hypotheses and didn't want to control the data so much that if somebody saw, thought they saw an alien or had contact with an alien from a ship, we don't look at that, that's nuts, but we'll look at this one where somebody saw a saucer land in that distant field or in the sky. So NICAP controlled the civilian narrative for at least the respectable civilian narrative for quite some time until some cases in the 1960s, notably a UFO landing in Socorro, New Mexico, which was seen by uh, uh, the sheriff's deputy, Lonnie Zamora, where he saw little aliens next to the craft or little beings next to this egg-shaped craft get back into the craft and it take off with this fiery trail behind it. I think NICAP began taking taking that seriously. And then the Betty and Barney Hill, the first abduction story broken then, everybody started taking it seriously so but for that there was a period throughout the 50s because of NICAP that if you were if you were a respectable UFO person you didn't talk about the encounter cases with aliens at all just with the distant you know flying saucer flying saucer encounters I suppose where you didn't see the beings so that's the significance of NICAP in a nutshell there's more to it but that's just an overview I have one last question, then I'll let Will do, have a question for you here in a second. So we're talking about all these alien encounters and flying saucers and stuff. Do you think or have you researched it from a spiritual point of view? Do you think it's possibly maybe fallen angels? Because we have an alien angel connection. Um, have you used biblical reference or anything if you want to? I don't know. Or any other spiritual reference books that might have dictated or written something similar down in, in their um, script or scriptures or whatever do you think there could be a spiritual connection to all this too i think there almost certainly is a spiritual connection to some of the genuine the the genuine encounters with with let's just say beings or entities john keel and jacques valet who were both were probably arguably the two most important thinkers within the space that thought there was something real to the phenomenon but that it wasn't extraterrestrial in other words people were having these encounters they didn't doubt people were experiencing meetings with weird beings seeing strange lights in the sky undergoing these contact experiences neither of them were christian but both of them thought that these encounters were from some other entities masquerading essentially as extraterrestrials. Jacques Vallée wrote a book called Passport to Magonia very early on after the Condon Committee, which was the University of Colorado study employed by the Air Force, kind of closed down official UFO investigations by the government in 1969. Jacques Vallée, who was a PhD, he was an astronomer and he was also an information scientist, was so disheartened by that that he started to look at more esoteric explanations. And he thought that the aliens or what we perceived as aliens fit into a pattern that went back through various occult traditions like fairy lore and demonology and the like. John Keel always suggested that these things fit far more with patterns of demonology than they did with the idea of them being spacemen from another planet. So I think even outside of a Christian space, the thinkers that I admire have long admired the most within the UFO community have identified this as something other than extraterrestrial, something that is deceiving us, and something that might have a far closer connection to this planet and to mankind. And I think even today you're beginning to see that. Interestingly, even in David Grush's testimony in the most recent UAP hearings, where he's very reluctant to say that it's extraterrestrial, he started to kind of almost wax poetically for a moment in there about it being like a higher dimension coming down and entering our own. Leslie Keen, the author or the writer who broke the original New York Times story in 2017 and broke the David Grush story recently in the debrief, has said similar things about these maybe being interdimensional. Now, interdimensional is really just a modern scientific word from, you know, somehow operating outside of this reality, which is exactly the same as what you're talking about, Emily, okay. about it being perhaps some kind of spiritual um, interjection into this reality. So I'm very sympathetic to those type of interpretations. If there's, a, if there's a genuine phenomenon which isn't just psychological and sociological, I think it fits better with older patterns 
of demonologies and fairy faith and those type of stories than it does with the idea of them really being spacemen, spacemen from another planet. Go ahead, Will, if you want to have a <laughs> Yeah, no, this is a great conversation. I, I, I love this. I mean, this is, is like right up my alley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is why Dean's been back for part two, and I have a feeling he's going to be back for part three. <laughs> oh, anytime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dean, I mean, now that we've seen David Grush come out and have this, you know, whole, you know, dog and pony show in front of, you know, the, you know, the congressional you know, people, and uh, Commander Favor, I think, was on there as well. Uh, who is a Navy uh, captain or pilot? Um, what do you think this is? Is this is this really truly people that are you know have been exposed to some things and have been told stories, or do you think this is just another narrative that the government's trying to push? I mean, as of recently, what is two months ago, we shot down three UFOs supposedly, and you know you know the North American region uh, between you know uh, I think it was Michigan and Alaska and another place. So, I mean, what do you what do you think is happening right now? Is is this all a part of a plan, or is just happenstance? I'm almost certain that it's a controlled leak of information through Grush. It's interesting that Grush helped draft the whistleblower legislation that let him be a whistleblower. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So it isn't like right. some lower ranking person who came out and said, "I know about the UFO people." It's somebody who was in a position to help draft law that would let him come forward. Ever since the 2017 story, which kind of made this more, more palatable again, which broke in the New York Times, there's been to me a feeling that it's that there's been specific talking points rolled out by specific people to serve a specific narrative. And you're right when you were talking, Will, about the other two witnesses with him at the hearing. One, of course, was pilot Ryan Graves, and the other one was Navy Commander David Fravor. Now, both of those people have been con specifically graves have been consistently rolled out in the media every time they want to sell the story that this technology can't be ours. Right. So right. the American people are more likely to believe an active serviceman mm -hmm. who says, I've seen this, this is nothing we're flying. This isn't ours because I believe most American servicemen as well. They give, they risk their lives for our country. But I think there's a disingenuity to the way it's been pushed out. Just because you're a Navy fighter pilot doesn't mean that you have any idea of what's being tested in Skunk Works or in uh, any other Black Ops project. You would be briefed on what the Navy had. You would be briefed on what, I guess, our Army and Air Force had. You'd be briefed on what we knew the Chinese had and what we knew the Russians had. You would never be read into whatever was being tested in Skunk Works. And right. we know in the past, the, the ex-head of Skunk Works, what was his name, Ben Rich, who's passed now, mm -hmm. made public no, in public speeches said things like we've got the technology to send et home if you've seen it in star trek or star it's wars we've like done cool. it or we you know we could do it so the level of the technology which is being built upon billions of dollars just going into black budget holes mm -hmm. lord knows what they have and to be honest neither of the navy pilot the neither the navy pilot or the navy commander they rolled out in that recent uh, congressional hearing would have any idea about what they've got in in mm -hmm. in those projects. What I think was interesting, just quickly, because are we almost out of time? Maybe um, I can't we we have a few more minutes. I want you to touch base too on the man who invented flying saucers and tell about your documentary and when hopefully it'll be out and we can buy, mm -hmm. rent, whatever. When can we watch it? <laughs> Well, we probably can't watch it for a while. I'm about halfway through the shooting of the man who invented flying saucers. I'm probably about 30 minutes into the edit. I still have about half of it to shoot. I'd love to have it finished next year. And I think sometime next year it will be completed, but it won't be like, I don't think it'll be January. I think it'll be closer towards, you know, this time next year or the later year. next year because post takes a long time, you know, even after you've shot it all, it takes a long time to have it ready. Mm -hmm. And then I'm not even sure how I'll release. I'd love to do the festival circuit because that's my background. I run film festivals. So I'd love to play at a, a festival or two. We have other questions. They know that we're cutting out. So Allison is like part three. So yeah, we're going to have yes. it back for part three. So. Oh, I'd love <laughs> anyway, to come back. Uh, Dr. D Dean, if you don't mind, uh, the best way to keep up with you and stuff, and you have you have shows that you have every weekly too on um, every week on Untold Radio. But the best way to get a hold of you is through the website and possibly Facebook. The man who invented flying saucers, or 
Sure. If you if you just go to at the moment, it just points to the Facebook page for the film. But if you go to the sha the shavermystery dot com, that'll take you to the Facebook page for the man who invented flying saucers, and you can message me there. That's a good way of getting hold of me. But yes, please do watch Talking Weird and Mysterious Library, which is every uh, Saturday night. Talking Weird on uh, Untold Radio Network and Mysterious Library is every Tuesday night at um, 9 p.m. for Mysterious Library Central and 10 p.m. for Talking Weird Saturday on, again, the Untold Radio Network. Well, thank you so much for coming on. We'll let you go right now, but I'll be in touch with you, you know, we'll, um, and we'll get you back on the show and we'll, we'll go any further details and in, in, in things. We've got tons of questions still in the comments, so thank you, everybody, for tuning in. So we'll let you go for tonight. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Mr. Will and Miss Emily. I appreciate it. <laughs> have a good evening. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Take care. There we have it. We have Mr. Mr. Dr. Dean Bertram yeah. on all about you. Super interesting stuff. He's full of knowledge. Like, yeah, he has a lot I of. Uh, I need to go down this rabbit hole a little bit more because I haven't gone down down it that much with all these names from the 40s and 50s and 60s. Yeah, yeah, it's a cra it's a crazy rabbit hole. I mean, it goes in a lot of different ways, but. It, it it does center around the same thing, which is the government at this, you know, everything you know, at the end of the day. So it's pretty, it's pretty interesting once you start going down it, but there's, there's a lot to go down. Well, we, he's mentioned some stuff today, like cavers. So next week we're having Stephen Kelly come back on, but we're going to be talking about direct energy weapons because he was a laser mm. creator for the military back in the day in the seventies when laser technology was coming up. So um, it's called laser cavers and magic Occupy the Getty oh, museum wow. in, in LA. And then I'm also really excited because we kind of talked about voices in the head tonight and we're having mm -hmm. Dr. Carissa Wineland come on. A lot of people, I didn't know about this. And I went down this rabbit hole last week um, about V2K, Voices to Skull, or it's called um, uh, Voice of God um, mm -hmm. devices that the government has to actually put these voices in your head. Oh, yeah. Absolutely yeah, in your on. head. So yeah, th this month is going to be awesome. And then October, September, October is my two favorite months. October oh, is it's creepy season. Banging with all kinds of amazing paranormal people coming on. So I'm really excited. Yes. It's going to be next couple months. It's going to be awesome with amazing guests. So thank you everybody for tuning in. We appreciate you so much. Please share this out. It helps our show. It helps our guests. It helps our network. We love you all. And we'll see you again here next time on 107.7 FM. New Orleans next Friday night, same time, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a wonderful weekend.